Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk titled Privacy Preserving Security Protocols for the Internet of Vehicles. Uh, my name is Biplab Sekdar, and I'm from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, the National University of Singapore. So this is sort of a overview of uh, the talk today. So I'll give you a very high level overview of security issues in vehicle environments. And then uh, I'll give you one example of privacy preserving protocol and in and specifically we'll talk about authentication for uh, the internet of vehicles. And then I'll give you an overview of some of the other possible you know, open problems and other work in privacy for vehicle environments that is going on and there's still potential for further work in that area. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, increasingly what we see is our vehicles are being equipped with a large number of sensors, onboard computers, and so on. A typical vehicle now would have more than uh, close to 100 microprocessors on it and have a large number of sensors associated. And historically, what would be is that all the data that is generated by these sensors is processed onboard in the vehicle itself. But now we see vehicles communicating with other vehicles, uh, V2V communications or vehicles communicating with the roadside infrastructure or maybe with the pedestrians and so on. And the whole idea is that by exchanging this kind of an information, we can make our transportation system more efficient, more safe and, and uh, more robust against various uh, disturbances. So the, the whole idea of this, uh, of the internet of vehicles is that the vehicles have a number of sensors and other things that, is gen that are generating data. And they also have network connectivity. And then the vehicles may communicate with each other or to pedestrians or to roadside units. And together they share data. The data may be stored somewhere in the cloud and then analyzed and processed. And the whole thing coming together brings us to the internet of vehicles. And this chart shows you how uh, the evolution of uh, you know connected vehicles or the internet of vehicles over the years. So what started off with the vision for intelligent transportation systems in the mid nineties, uh, where you know it's just uh, use of data to make things more efficient. So we came to more about uh, connected vehicles, and then uh, at the time the vehicles would just be sort of talking to either just each other or maybe to a roadside unit. And now we are at the era of uh, the internet of vehicles where everybody is connected to the cloud. It's sort of an uh, extrapolation of the concept of internet of things. And there are a number of things that are advantages that will be brought about by IoT, um, sorry, the internet of vehicles. Let me get a pen here. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, starting with uh, connected vehicles and vehicular auto automation, uh, two things, you know, the, the, the use of connected vehicles and vehicular automation, along with all the things associated with the collection and processing of data, they come together in the Internet of Vehicles. And these are sort of the benefits we can expect out of this, which is in terms of redu reduction of congestion and emissions and, and improved, uh, reduced travel time, uh, <laughs> improved accessibility and, and improvement in the sa safety and security and, and so on. So now let's come a little bit more towards the how, how vehicles generate data and how that data may be used. So there are a number of different sensors as we're talking about in, in, in the vehicles and they may, and the vehicles would be, uh, have network connectivity. So they may talk to roadside units, they may talk to, you know, other vehicles. Uh, when they go to the repair shop, they may, they may access the network there and uh, you know the, the other mobile devices in the vehicle may also be connected to it and all of this will connect uh, give you access to the internet backbone and autonomous vehicle the, your regular vehicles generate a lot of data and when we go to the era of autonomous vehicles uh, we expect you know each vehicle to be generating in the order of thousands of gigabits uh, gigabytes per day right so it's a lot of data that will be generated and anytime you're generating data, you have you have sensors that are controlling important activities in the vehicle. And then these devices and the vehicle is connected to the internet. Uh, we expect cyber threats to come up, right? So so then uh, if, if, you, if you have a device that is connected to the internet, you can always expect malicious entities to hack into your system and then uh, you either steal your data or to, to 
cause problems in many, many other ways, right? So, uh, for example, you may have communications that are inside the vehicle and communications that go outside the vehicle. Of course, when your 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 uh, your vehicle is connected to the internet, the threats may originate there. And once they enter your vehicle, once they have established a foothold inside your vehicle, all the internal communications inside your vehicle, they may also be susceptible to different attacks. Just to give you a view, quick overview of some of these possible attacks, uh, you know, uh, somebody, a, a malicious vehicle may inject false data. So for example, two vehicles are communicating with each other to, uh, uh, to, to coordinate then, uh, you know, uh, make traffic flow smoother. If this guy sends a malicious message to the to the person in front that hey, there's traffic jam ahead, the car just moves out of its way, and then you have a free way to go through. Right. So this is a simple example, not very malicious, maybe in some sense, but still shows you the potential for uh, attacks in vehicle networks. This one is probably a little bit uh, more uh, malicious. In this case, there is an accident somewhere and uh, you know the, the 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 message that the vehicle should be sending out is to say hey slow down but let's say somebody has hacked into this roadside unit this is supposed to broadcast the slow down message to everybody else in the network but since this uh, roadside unit has been hacked into it sends out a message saying everything is clear you can proceed as 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 normal right so then this car is going to go and potentially uh, crash into the vehicles that are stopped in front uh, there could be other things. So, for example, let's say there's an accident, and if there, are, there usually vehicles would exchange information, and then you know you would know that this, let's say, this green car was in the vicinity of this, uh, 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 caused the accident here, and then uh, ran away. Later on, you can claim to the police if you are able to, you know, edit and modify any messages. You can later on claim to the police that I wasn't there and basically uh, do a repudiation, right? So, so if, if you allow your uh, messages to be modified without any consequences, then again, you may have, have problems. And then the other one, which is probably a bigger focus of today's talk is about privacy. So in general, if you are a car and you are broadcasting messages to the roadside units or to other vehicles around you, periodically, and that period maybe let's say every few seconds or maybe every few minutes, then others know about your presence in a certain location. And if they're moving along, or maybe they're roadside units and they periodically pick up messages from you, then they can track your movement. And that's sort of a privacy violation. So we may so while there are benefits to exchanging these messages, they also come with privacy concerns. And then the question is, how do we uh, protect against this privacy concerns? And then this 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 example was about vehicles <clears throat> exchanging messages and that leading to privacy concerns. You know, when you have autonomous vehicles and so on, they have cameras and uh, uh, other other sensors that pick up. The, the information about the presence of a particular uh, individual, uh, the data that has been collected by these sensors that you have here, that can also lead to privacy concerns. And in general, you know, most surveys would show that people are very uncomfortable, mo most of them. There are some who are either new, neutral or, 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 or they, don't, they don't care, but the overwhelming majority of people are either uncomfortable or, or very uncomfortable with these privacy issues. And as a result, most government, most governments across the world, they have started taking steps to en enforce regulation around how you can collect the data and how you can store and process the data. So hopefully through this, we have established that uh, uh, privacy is a important concern in the internet of vehicles or in vehicle and networks. So let's look at some possible ways in which uh, we can preserve the privacy of, of users and still be able to harness the uh, benefits that come through the Internet of Vehicles. So in particular, what I will do is I'll probably take the next 10 minutes or so to talk about one specific example of a privacy-preserving protocol for Internet of Vehicles. 
And in this case, we are talking about privacy preserving authentication. So we want the vehicles to, before they can exchange messages in the network, they should be authenticated. And while authenticating, I want them to be authenticated, but then I don't want to disclose any private information that can uh, lead to identification of the vehicles, right? By, by, by bystanders and, and third parties who shouldn't have access. Okay, so this is sort of uh, leading to it. So data transfer in, in, in the Internet of Vehicles. Uh, we should allow vehicles and RSUs to transfer the data only after they have confirmed their identity. Uh, and one particular concern in this, our work is to look at physical attacks, right? Uh, in, in, so just as an example, when you have a car, let's say, uh, sometime, most of the times the car may be with you, but then you park it in certain locations let's say in a garage, and then you go to your office and then you really don't know who is accessing your car and not accessing your car because it's physically out there. You may say, hey, I have a, a surveillance camera so I will know if somebody touches my car, maybe. Uh, but what about if you take your car for maintenance to a garage? There, the mechanics would be actually hooking your car to their computers and then accessing all kinds of data from your computer, from, your, from the onboard computers in your car. Uh, do you really trust all the mechanics in the world to be honest and not uh, try to look for private information in your in your vehicles? The answer is no, right? So you have to you have to protect it against um, attacks where uh, maybe a mechanic is malicious, but they have physical access to your vehicle, and then if they have physical access to your vehicle, then they can compromise, for example, any secret keys that you'll store in your vehicle or or uh, at the R RSU. So then the question is, how do we protect against, how do we ensure that, uh, you know, our, our uh, the, 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 the secrets that we have in, in the, those secrets may be in terms of data as well as the keys that you use to access the, the network and they are secure. And uh, what we are looking at in terms of the desired properties for any privacy preserving protocol is, of course, it should be privacy preserving. Uh, we also want it to be robust against physical attacks. And then we want it to be efficient and, and the overheads should be low. And of course, privacy preservation. And uh, conventionally, of course, uh, these secret keys in, in, in these IoT devices or the internet of vehicles and cars and so on, you would store your secret key in a memory on the device. But if somebody has physical access, then they can steal these secrets because they can hook up, uh, you know, they can they can read through your memory and, and, and so on. So one option to secure against such physical attacks is to go for hardware level security primitives. And the idea here is that just like, you know, humans have fingerprints and when you go from one country, let's say if you were to come into Singapore, at the airport, you would have to put it your, your fingerprints, right? And that acts as a biometric identifier of the human being. So physical security primitives aim to create such fingerprints for semiconductor devices. And one option of doing this is through physical and clonable functions, which exploit the process variations that will occur during the semiconductor manufacturing process. So semiconductor manufacturing process is a very, very controlled environment and a controlled process. But still, there are certain things that you cannot really control, and they will lead to very, very minute variations in the in the in the physical characteristics of the of the transistors, of the gates, and then the wires that you fabricate. And these can be used to come up with fingerprinting techniques for each individual IC. Right. So these are some of the so just as an example, right? These are some of the steps you would follow for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, you know, you'll take on with a silicon substrate, you would add some photoresistant up, then you'll take your mask, shine some UV on it to, to etch the pattern, and then you will uh, do the etching and the stripping, and in the end, you'll come up with your pattern that you want, right? And in general, your patterns will have these nice looking layouts, which everything at straight lines and 90 degrees and so on. But when you do the actual fabrication, when you have completed all of these steps, uh, you know, you'll have some minute variation. So for example, these will not be 90 degree anymore. If the whole thing was 10 nanometers or, or let's say 100 nanometers, you may get 99 nanometers, right? And every time you repeat the same process again and again, these variations will be random. You cannot really control. Just as an example, 
you know, when you have a 45 nanometer technology, if you're trying to come up with a gate which is whose length is 28 nanometer, usually you may have about a two nanometer variation. So even though <clears throat> you you try to control the process as 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 well as possible, but there'll still be certain variations. And then you can use these variations to come up with physical and clonable functions. And one way of thinking about this is that now we have a function built in. So if you give it a certain bit pattern as a challenge, you give it a set of bits as challenge, you will get a set of bits as the response. And if you use the same circuit in different ICs, you give the same challenge to each one of them, the output of them will be unique and then can be considered as a fingerprint of that device. And with pubs, then there is no need to store secrets. You give it certain challenge, you observe the response, and since the response is unique for each device, it essentially serves as a fingerprint. So this is sort of a pictorial representation of the idea. You have the same circuit or the same function built in in every one of these devices. You give the same challenge, but because of these uh, variations that you have in the circuit level that were you know randomly created, the output of the circuit from each of these chips, they will not be the same and they will be unique. They'll be different. So they will serve as our fingerprints. All right. So these are some of the advantages of the use of PUFs. So they provide you higher physical security and then also provide you security against timing, power monitoring, and other side channel attacks. So now let's come to our privacy preserving uh, authentication protocol, right? And here what we assume is that all of these devices, either roadside units, uh, the 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 roads. So so this is our um, system model. So you have these vehicles, right? Each one of these vehicles would connect through a roadside unit, your nearest roadside unit. A number of roadside units. So that's your layer one. Uh, the roadside units from layer two, and a number of these roadside units will connect to a roadside unit gateway, and ultimately the roadside unit gateway will be connected to a trusted authority. So each of these, the gate, the, the vehicles and the roadside units, they have their own puff or the physical and clonable function. They're equipped with a physical and clonable function. And uh, the, the RSU is also equipped with a uh, puff. Uh, these, the RSU and the vehicles, they're out in the open and they are not physically secure. But the RSU gateway and the trusted authority, they are considered to be secure. Okay. <clears throat> And in terms of what we consider for the adversary, this is the traditional uh, Yolev Dao model. Uh, and here we assume that the, uh, uh, you know, we can model the capabilities of the adversary through a number of, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, function calls that they can make. And the, the, the adversary is able to send and uh, receive messages. They're able to monitor your messages. They can delete messages. They can, uh, you know, even read through your memory and and uh, extract the secrets that you're storing. So the adversary may impersonate as a vehicle, or it may impersonate as the trusted authority. So both sides. So initially, we have a registration. So let's, we're coming to the protocol. So initially, we have a device registration phase. Uh, okay. This is before the operation of the whole system. Uh, each vehicle, which is uh, each new vehicle, will register itself with the trusted authority. And you have to give one of your challenge response pairs your crypto identity. So this is this is not your real identity, but an uh, encrypted version or, or a pseudo identity uh, to, to the uh, trusted authority. In addition, you may give some additional emergency CRPs and emergency identities in case of, uh, you know, uh, like a loss of synchronization at the time you can recover. And each vehicle will also store a nonce that is used for generating a crypto identity. Similarly, the RSU will have access to the initial crypt, uh, CRP that, that was stored at the trusted authority, as well as the list of emergency CRPs and uh, identities of each RSU. So this is sort of the overall protocol. So maybe what I'll do now is I will zoom into each one of them specifically. So it's a little bit clearer, right? So uh, this, this is the first step. So initially what happens is let's say a vehicle wants to, so these are the vehicles and these are the ones that want to authenticate themselves. 
So what will uh, so each vehicle will send its crypto identity and a random nonce to the roadside unit. What the roadside unit will do is it will use its own path and based on the challenge that was stored, it will create a response. This is coming through the hardware. Next, it will consolidate all the messages, authentication requests from the vehicles and then encrypt it using this response that it just generated. And it will also send a integrity check for the message. Now, these messages are now received at the, uh, the this consolidated authentication requests are received by the gateway next. So what the gateway will do is gateway already knows, has stored the challenge response pair for the roadside unit. So it will read the CRP. When it reads the CRP, it obtains what the response is, right? And if it knows what the response, then it can decrypt the message. It will verify the integrity. And then once it has decrypted the message, it will obtain the original authentication request. Then it generates its own nonce. Now that it has verified that it is really coming from an you know, authenticated, uh, well, it's coming, it's verified that it's coming from the roadside unit. Uh, it again consolidates all of these messages, adds its own nonce, creates its own uh, integrity check, and then sends it to the trusted authority. At the trusted authority, uh, you, the, the, the uh, trusted authority will do the same. So it will um, verify the integrity of the message. It, it already has the, uh, the, the CRP stored uh, uh, for all the vehicles. It will take out the CRP for each one of those vehicles and then verify all the integrity check messages and so on. And once it has, uh, it will generate a class access token for each one of the vehicles. So this is the access token for each one of the vehicles. It will create an authentication parameter for each um, uh, 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 service request. And then it will create a combined message for each uh, authentication request. Uh, it will combine a message, it will create a message for each authentication request from each vehicle. And then it creates a combined message with all the responses, creates an integrity check for that message, sends it back to the gateway. At the gateway, again, we verify the integrity, we decrypt it, uh, the messages, and then send the individual messages to all the RSUs in your area. And when you do that, you add your own new integrity check and then so on. And then uh, you also update the, the, the crypto identity of the RSU, the crypto identity of the RSU getting updated. And then you send this <coughs> back to the, <coughs> sorry, to the roadside unit. And once this message is received at the vehicle, uh, what the vehicle will do is each vehicle will use its puff to get the response corresponding to the challenge. It will decrypt the T's, it will verify the integrity checks, and then it will update its own identity. So, so this will prevent the tracking of vehicles and ensure privacy preservation. Okay, and then it will send the acknowledgement back in the in the form of an authentication parameter. And ultimately, the trusted authority will verify all of this. And at this time, the mutual authentication for both sides is done. And uh, one of the features is that we don't want to keep reusing the same challenge response pair again and again. At the time, there's potential for machine learning attacks on this. And somebody may be able to detect uh, your, your you know, challenge, may be able to map the challenge to a certain response. So what we also have is we have a CRP update mechanism. So after every so many use, or if you want, after every authentication attempt, we modify the challenge response pair that is being used by the trusted authority. So for this, the trusted authority reads uh, the challenge response pair for the old one, and then it creates a, a new challenge, this new challenge that is created, and then it will send it off to the vehicle. And once it reaches the vehicle, it verifies everything, make sure uh, you know it's really coming from the trusted authority. Then it finds out what the new response should be for this new challenge, and then sends this new response back to the trusted authority. Uh, 
And then once it reaches the trusted authority, it'll update its uh, database. Of course, it'll ensure that the the, the authenticate the message is authenticated and it's fresh and everything else. Okay. So here are some of some informal security analysis for uh, the protocol. Uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, we are able to establish mutual authentication between the vehicles. We are able to establish mutual authentication because between the RSU and the RSU gateway. And we can also establish the mutual authentication between the RSU gateway and the trusted authority. And through the use of different uh, uh, crypto identities, we avoid anonymity. Uh, we, we provide anonymity and avoid traceability. And the use of uh, you know, emergency identities uh, helps us to prevent uh, the, you know, the detrimental effects of denial of service attacks. And since we're using a nonce every time, we prevent replay attacks. And then the use of pups provides security against physical and cloning attacks. And just in comparison of the um, complexity of our protocol against some of the other protocols in literature, in general, we require fewer operations, both at the vehicle as well as the trusted authority. Uh, similarly, when we look at uh, the message size. Uh, the message size in the proposed protocol is actually smaller than comparable protocols in literature. <laughs> and this is um, you know, the, the overall complexity and comparing with some other protocols. Okay. All right, so now let's come to the last part of the talk, which focuses primarily on some of the other privacy challenges which are out there and some open problems. So one, another thing that we have to worry about in terms of privacy for the Internet of Vehicles is uh, privacy of the location information. So in many cases, you know, to, to provide uh, many of the Internet of Vehicle uh, services that they depend on your current location. And if you want to avail these services, you have to provide what your location is to get access to this location, to get usable information from these location-based services. But every time you give away your, your location, you give away privacy. But if you don't give your exact location, you don't get proper service, right? So there's a trade-off between privacy and service. So there's a lot of work on uh, location anonymity where you provide certain queries and then the location anonymizer will add some noise to your, to your query. So when you give to the lo actual location-based uh, server, uh, you have a cloaked, spatial location, you don't give your exact location, but some some approximate location maybe. So the question is then, how do you calculate this cloaked spatial region? And then what are the trade-offs and what's the sort of, given your requirements, your objectives, what is the optimal way of coming up with these uh, um, uh, cloaked locations? And then uh, another uh, specific problem in these cases is, you know, many times when you are trying to optimize your transportation systems, you want to know what is the path being taken by a, a certain vehicle or, or a set of vehicles. But if I know where your origin and destination is, that gives me access to other information, right? It, it, it compromises your privacy. So now I know where you live, maybe, or where you work. So we want transportation system operators to have some idea about where where my uh, uh, you know transportation or where where I start my journey and where I end my journey uh, but then I don't want to give exact information so then instead of using real information can I generate synthetic traces that sort of have the same statistical properties but not they are not related to any any specific human so they they, they cannot be traced back so there's a lot of work that goes on now in generating these privacy-preserving uh, traces. Now, in terms of some of the other open problems that are there, so we worry about security and privacy for the IOV data that is being stored in the clouds. The inclusion of electric vehicles also brings up a new set of challenges. And the increased use of AI and machine learning applications in IOV, they also come up, they also have their own, uh, you know, security and privacy challenges. So just, uh, just the first problem, the, the security and privacy in the cloud. So when we were talking about IOV in general in the beginning, we saw that 
you know, the, the, the vehicles are generating a lot of data, they have network connectivity, and ultimately this data is being stored somewhere. And usually this data is being stored in the, in the cloud. Now, do you really trust your cloud provider? And if you, maybe you trust your cloud provider, but then there are other users also using the same cloud server, let's say. <clears throat> are you sure they are not able to access your data? So there are a large number of cybersecurity challenges, and there are some of them may be related to the to the clouds, and some of them are related to the vehicles and during the trans the, during the transit of the data in the network. But here's a set of you know how do you uh, secure your data in the cloud and how do you ensure data privacy in the cloud. Now let's talk about electric vehicles. So one of the problems with electric vehicles is that you know you have to charge them frequently. And if you're charging them in your in your home, fine. But if you're charging them out in the in uh, in a charging station, then the charging station sort of knows where you are. Right? So there's a problem with location leakage. And then if I know exactly where you you know uh, frequently charge your your vehicles, I know what kind of trajectory you need or you you follow and things like that. So how do you ensure that users are able to charge their vehicles at random locations, but still be able to um, protect their privacy? So that, that's a open area of, of research. And then the last one we were talking about is attack on artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So increasingly we see AI and ML being integrated into smart vehicles, and they're commonly also being used by the uh, IOV applications. And usually your, your, the machine learning, uh, your AI or ML pipeline starts with a training phase where you use the data to learn something or, or develop your machine learning model, and then you deploy them. And this is your testing or inference phase. And both of these are susceptible to attack. So for example, during the training phase, I may poison your data. I give you incorrect data based on which you're learning. So, the, so your model is incorrect. So that will be an example of poisoning attack. And another example, maybe when you are already in your testing or inference phase, uh, I may try to impersonate somebody. I may be able, I may, so your, your model is your intellectual property. I may try to invert your model and, and learn the weights of your model. So I, I steal your intellectual property. Or maybe you have your, you're using your, uh, uh, the AI or machine learning model to detect certain things, maybe detect attacks. So maybe I want to evade such attacks. So there are all these different kinds of attacks which are possible. And here's just one example, right? So so, so if you have a smart vehicle, it probably should be able to look at the roadside signs like this and interpret that this is a stop sign. But people have also demonstrated the use of adversarial examples. So you add some random noise. So to the human eye, it may look like a, like a stop sign, but to the machine learning model, it will lead to incorrect classification, and, and you know it may be interpreted as a as a as a as a speed limit sign. And there's a lot of uh, this particular area happens to be quite popular now for for research, and there's a lot of work going on in in terms of privacy for AI and machine learning. Uh, this particular table just gives you a snapshot of all of these. So that sort of brings me to the of my talk. So what we saw is that uh, uh, privacy in general is a, is an important problem in vehicular networks, and there are a lot of different aspects or, or facets to this privacy problem. And one particular area that we spend some time talking today is about authentication protocol and how to provide security and privacy in the presence of physical security in, in the presence of physical attacks uh, in, in those environments. So thank you very much for your interest and thank you very much for uh, the invitation to give this talk at VTC4. Thank you.